We say good morning to everyone on this wonderful Father's Day, to everyone here in the congregation, to everyone coming to us by way of this magical little box that stands in front of us. We hope you're having a wonderful day. <clears throat> we intend to uh, honor, honor the fathers in our lives and the men that have made a difference in our lives, even though they may not be father by blood. A lot of us have been pretty much raised and reared by someone that was not father, but they played the role and they did the work. So we're here to honor all of those men. So welcome to Cornerstone Community Church, whether you're here with us or whether you're on the stream. And is it time? Was it? A hymn. A hymn. Let's sing a hymn, Bob. All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 22, my first bookmark. We'll go there. Thank you. And then turn over into the New Testament. <clears throat> and find. I know it's here. I know it's here. I saw it just the other day. <laughs> Gospel of Luke. Well, I might have to put these on again. I do apologize. Boy, things were so much easier when I was younger. Everything was easy when I was young. And I thought it was so hard then. I thought when I was younger, I thought everything was so hard. Really. <clears throat> I, honey, when I was your age, I thought everything was so hard. So hard. Now I find out it was pretty easy, actually. <laughs> it was actually pretty easy. Let's go just uh, to chapter 4. If you have your bookmark. You can put it in there. If you have your little bing bing, you have to just go back to it, okay? So let's go to Genesis and talk about a most remarkable relationship. A most remarkable relationship between a father and a son. How many of you have sons? Okay. How many of you have daughters? Which is more difficult to raise? I'm asking. Son, daughters, daughter, son. So you're telling me whatever you happen to have, <laughs> that's pretty difficult to raise. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. We have one daughter. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when you have daughters, they go out and they bring people back. They bring these guys back to the house. And you have to sit on the couch with them. And you have to pull out every, if you know the guy's coming over, it's so inconvenient. Because you have to pull out the gun cleaning kit. You have to pull out all the pistols and shotguns. And you have to lay them on the couch. So that when he comes in to date your daughter or granddaughter, you're sitting there with a 12 gauge just wiping it down with a cloth. Just a little subliminal message to the young man. Because, gentlemen, remember, you were a young man, too. And you know how that is. <clears throat> a most remarkable relationship. First, uh, chapter 22. Now, it came about after these things. And that's an important statement. Because that statement implies and proves to us that Isaac had had some years of growth. He was not a baby anymore. He was in... Uh, later adolescence or even young adulthood. Remember in these days, adolescence lasted differently than the way it does now. So this, this was a young man, a late teenager or an early 20. This was not a baby anymore. This was a young man who had his own thoughts and was able to do his own actions on himself. So time had passed. And God tested Abraham and said to him, keep this also in mind, God never tempts man. You can go to the book of James and he will, he will uh, imply, or not imply, he will tell you that. He will confirm that if you are having temptation, this is not of God. God does not tempt his children to sin. So we can't do like old Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Oh, I guess we can do that, isn't it? Because that is right. It's the devil that tempts, but it is God who will test. 
Every one of you, if you are God's child, you will be tested and tested and tested. And guess what comes next? Another test. What is the use of all this testing? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But God does not tempt. He tests. And he called to Abraham. And Abraham said, Here I am. He said, God said, Take now your son, your only son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Notice the impact, the import, how important this relationship was. Take now your only son, your only son, Isaac, the son that you love. God is making a strong, strong point about the relationship that Abraham had with his son, Isaac, the one you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. <clears throat> Pardon the sniffing, I apologize. Somewhere in Abraham's mind, it had to pass through. God, are you kidding me? Am I hearing you? You know, all kinds of voices go through our heads. We hear all sorts of things. Most of the time, it's us. You do realize, don't you? Most of the time, the voice you hear is you. If you go out and buy that new car and get head over heels in debt, that wasn't God. That was you. <laughs> if you buy a house three times the size that you need and struggle to make the payments, it doesn't matter how much you pray, that was not God putting you in that position. That was you. But okay, we all do that. We all have things that shine and twinkle, and I guess that's okay. We are human like everybody else. But remember who got them for you. You got them for you. There was a preacher on TV not many years ago that would tell you to go down to the, uh, to the Lexus dealership. And it was Lexus. And sit in the exact car that you wanted and claim it in the name of Jesus. I claim this Lexus in the name of Jesus. And she said, and I recall, she said, doesn't matter if you can pay for it or not. Claim that Lexus in the name of Jesus. Claim that Lexus in the name of Jesus. Turn that station and don't do go back there anymore. What kind of advice is that for a child of God to go away in debt for something that they don't need? That's not God. God provides our need. There ain't nobody yet I know that needs a Lexus. Now, if you can afford it, hallelujah. Go get it, baby. Go get it. Get two of them. Bring me back one. Because I've never even sat in a Lexus, let alone had one. So there's nothing wrong with buying what you can afford. But if you get pulled over the edge of debt, that's not God that did it. That's you. And that's me. And I've been there. And that's a rough cliff to climb back off, I tell you. Take now your son for a burnt offering, verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Some theologians say Mount Moriah or this place where Isaac is about to sacrifice his son is the same place where, where the temple was built, the same temple mount. Uh, they argue about that like all theologians do, but that would be kind of neat. That would be kind of uh, uh, powerful if, if Isaac was brought to be sacrificed on the place, the same mount where the temple would be built. <clears throat> and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place in which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young, man, young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over here. I'm sorry, we'll go over there. And we will worship and return. Follow the pronouns, plural pronouns. We will do two things. What's the first one? Sorry, three things. You're right. You're exactly right. Smarty. <laughs> Forgot I was in school with him. All right. Three things. Wait a minute. Oh. 
Three things. Okay, now, first thing is to go. We, we, plural, go. Second thing, worship. We will go, this little boy and I, this young adult and I, and we will worship this young adult and I. And what's next? We will come back. We will come back. back. Now there, you can circle that statement. That is one of the most powerful statements of faith in the entire Bible. We will come back. I got the wood. I got, I don't know how they made fire back then. I, I, I get, but he had some. <laughs> I don't know, matches, Zippo, I don't know what he had. But he had the wood. He had the ability to set it on fire. And he had this young boy. But he is saying there in his heart, not heart, in his spirit, he knows somehow God is going to make this thing turn out right. If you've been in a place where you you had nothing else to believe except that God is going to make this thing turn out right. You can't do it. My goodness, look what you're in. you got to go climb a mountain. you got all this wood. Of course, you make the young boy carry the wood, so that's okay. But you got to go up this mountain, and you're going to sacrifice your only son. God is going to work this out because you can't. Have you ever been in something that you could not possibly work out? Of course you have. Look at Bud. What's, uh, uh, has it been a year yet? In August, a year, got a phone call. Bud has, what? You guys just left. You went on vacation. Have a good time. See your family. And what? Bud has, what? Cancer. Who's going to work that out, Betty? Who's going who's to figure that out? Who's going to make that come around the right way? The Lord is the only one that can do that. The same God that worked this out for Abraham and Isaac is the, exactly the same God that worked out your situation. Of course, we know Mickey's had struggle after struggle, but you walked in the door of that other church just like we always knew you would. You're still here. Your eyes are getting better. Your kidneys function now. How does that work? When you're on dialysis for weeks and weeks and months and months, and suddenly, okay, my kidneys are working now. They say that doesn't happen, but it did. Your eyesight, you couldn't read, you couldn't read anything. <laughs> I was just say anything. This time last year, we were making special notes for you in the choir, you know, with words this big, yeah. One word at a time. Follow the flashcards. And now you see. Who did that? Keith, did you do that? No. Mickey, you didn't do it. I know you would have if you could. But you couldn't, so you didn't. It's the same God that worked out this dilemma that Abraham was in. So what dilemma are you in? Whatever it is. Place it in God's hands and believe that if you go into the midst of where God is calling you, and all the way if you worship through the fire, through the flood, through the cancer, through the blindness, through the money, through the whatever it is, if you meet it with a worshipful attitude, then God is going to bring you back. And it's going to work out somehow. Somebody ought to say amen to that. I mean, really. I mean, I'm not much of a Pentecostal guy, but I ought to get a rise out of you every now and then. I know the music was good because Bud smiled. He did. I was encouraged, Bud. I was encouraged. So let's see what happened. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on on Isaac, his son. And he took, took in his hand the fire. Okay, well, however they got it, they got the fire. And, uh uh-oh, what does your Bible say? Mine says knife. Might say sword. It's a knife. And not a little knife. This is a knife that a shepherd carries. This This is a killing knife. You have the small knives, but shepherds in those days would carry not just the staff, but they would carry the rod and the killing knife. And that knife would do exactly that. It was for the sheep that totally would not 
get in line, sheep that always jump the fence, sheep that always miss the voice of the shepherd, sheep that refuse to follow his leading into a pasture, into a quiet place. They finally got too much for the shepherd, and he took out the killing knife, and he gutted the sheep. Hmm. Don't like to hear that. I don't. But he took the killing knife. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built the altar. There he arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. What does what is, what is your Lord look like? What does that word Lord look like? Is it all capitals? Is it? Is it all capitals in your translation? If it's not, you ought to change translations. <laughs> it's all capitals. We're dealing with Jehovah God here. We're dealing with Yahweh, the great I Am, the self-existent one, the one that needs no other power to exist, the one that has always been and always will be. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife, but the angel of Yahweh called Jehovah, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God. Now that word fear is a little different for us today. It doesn't mean that we cower in the corner. Even though if God showed up right now in his Shekinah glory, that's probably what I would do. I've never seen it. I've read it. I've studied it. I've seen pictures of it done teaching on, on Exodus and the tabernacle, the temple. I've, I've, I know a little bit about the Shekinah glory of God. But if God made himself manifest right here, right now, what would we do? I would run to the nearest corner and cower, and I would say, Lord, forgive me, please. I'm a man of unclean lips. Please, please. But Abraham knew God better than I do. Abraham had spent more time with God than I have. Abraham had seen more things manifested in his life than I have. So he was used to a conversation or a connection with Yahweh God. Are we, have we spent enough time with God that, that we are used to his call? We are, we are, we welcome his voice. We know it when we hear it. Or is it just a strange, strange voice in the cacophony that goes through our mind? The only way we can truly know if it's God's voice is to spend so much time with him that that we know it above all other voices. And when that voice speaks, we go. When that voice, that it is above all other voices, speaks, we move, we do, we, we fight, we pray, we worship. There's always an action word that comes after God's call. There's always some action that is, God is calling for. And he said, I've lost, I'm sorry, Abraham called. All right. Then Abraham raised his knife, but we know what happened. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket. By his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the uh, name of that place, the Lord will provide. Yahweh, Jehovah will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Four things for the fathers here today and watching us out there. Four things. Number one, is it out of line for the Lord, Yahweh God, to test, not tempt, his children? My answer to you is no. In fact, the Bible says that you will know that you are one of God's children because he will discipline you. If you are one of God's kids, you can't get caught out in sin without God chastising you. You'll feel it. You'll hear it. Now, I will say this. <clears throat> if you can really stretch away from God, if you can really stop reading that Bible, if you can really stop praying, if you can really stop coming to church, if you can really get disconnected with God and all His people, 
The voice will be there, but you might miss it. The further you are from God, the longer you can stay out in the world. I found that out myself. The further you stretch out and get away from God and turn your back on Him, the longer you can live in the world. Of course, the consequences are deadly. A ruined body, a ruined mind, a ru ruined emotions, ruined relationships. Think of the prodigal son, what it cost. He was stretched away from his father, but it cost him in the end. Luke 4, I'm not, let's, let's just don't turn there. We know that that's when Jesus, after he was baptized, went out into the wilderness. And, and Satan came to him. You think you have a battle. I battle principalities <clears throat> that are not flesh and blood. I battle my own self, which is the worst thing I have to come up against. I'm my worst enemy. I absolutely am. I am just my worst enemy. I can make some decisions, and I can follow through on them and turn around and go, what in the world was I thinking? I know better than that. I know better. Did it anyway. That's, you know, that's when you know it's your voice and not God's. So we know that Jesus was tested Satan tempted him. Satan tempted to give him power, prestige, and make him a magnificent person in the eyes of everyone around. And that's not what he was at the time. He was just some itinerant preacher who didn't even have his own roof over his head. But Satan said, I'll give you everything. There's the test. I'm sorry, there's the temptation. But it was a test from his father because God the Father knew that Jesus would pass that test. And from then on, he wasn't tempted anymore. Tested, but not tempted. You and I have to gird our loins, get in Ephesians, get to the back of the sixth chapter, and figure out what the heck they're talking about with the full armor of God. What is all that stuff? You got a helmet and a breastplate and all this stuff. And you want me to walk around and I got a sword and I got a shield? Yes. Yes. If you want to fight off the devil, you're going to have to have something to do it with. Because you and nor I can do it. Question number two. As fathers have such a strong relationship that they would extra uh, do extraordinarily things. I wrote that wrong. <clears throat> Oh, as fathers, <laughs> we have extraordinary relationships. And we can do extraordinarily, extraordinary things based on that relationship. A father-son bond, a father-daughter bond is one of the hardest things to break. Sometimes I think it's harder to break than the, the man-wife bond. There's just something about a parent and child. That is such a bond. And you have such sway over those children. You can bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Or you can bring them up as the TV generation. As the, as the YouTube generation. Or just plant them in front of a big screen TV and let that raise them. You have such a strong bond. Grandfathers, I would say to you, you get to start all over. Where you were the law, now you can be grace. You can love them. You can pamper them. You can send them home when it's all said and done. Well, sometimes. <laughs> there are exceptions. <clears throat> Number three, how does knowing that the Lord has provided the lamb affect us? How does knowing that God has provided the lamb affect us? We talked on Wednesday night during our uh, uh, Revelation study, somebody asked, it was Jill, I think. Somebody asked, what happens after the church is raptured out of the world? And I believe in the, in the physical rapture of the church. And the Bible says that that power that's holding back evil will go with the church. H how, does, how do people deal with that when all hell breaks loose on this earth? Can they still be saved? The answer is yes. But they will have to die a martyr's death. 
You see, knowing that God has provided the sacrifice for us tells us that as long as we are in the boat <laughs> on the plane before the rapture of the church comes, we go on Jesus' ticket. He's got this ticket, and he stands at the front of the line, and they punch every time one of his kids go by. Punch, 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 punch. We go on Jesus' ticket. He bought the ticket on the cross. He paid for it in blood. And it's, and it's the ticket, the only ticket that God's kids can get to heaven on. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I say he is also the ticket. Knowing that God has provided the sacrifice and you have a place. There's a place for a punch on that ticket for you. My goodness, don't let that pass you by. Don't wait until, until the rapture occurs and all that. Well, I don't know how many people will go. I, who knows? Maybe one or two. Maybe thousands and thousands. I pray it's thousands and thousands. But I don't want you still here. I want your ticket punched. Because God has provided the lamb and the last thing. Miss Beverly, would you come, please? <clears throat> the last part of this scripture says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn. Who is the only one that can swear by himself? God. God is the only one that can swear by himself. We certainly are told not to swear by God, nor swear by Jesus. He is the only one that can do that. Thank you. You have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars for the heaven and the sand which is in the seashore. And your seed will possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they, were, they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Last, as we having, as we living on the blessing of someone else, and we are, we are all living on the blessing of somebody else you didn't provide this for you our forefathers provided this for us I was going into the doctor's office last week <clears throat> for the third time that week and this this older gentleman I would guess 90 91 he came out with what looked to be his son his son holding his right arm by the elbow and that older man walking with a slow, halted gait with a cane. And on his head was a navy cap with the name of his vessel where he served in World War II and saw action. You could see the ribbons and all the things that he had done. And even though I don't know all those, I know that they were battle ribbons. And I had passed them by because I didn't want to get in the way. And I got all the way inside and I couldn't take it. I could not take it. Because I knew that the blessings that man gave have, has come to me. I have received blessings from that old man that I've never met. Probably will never meet again. And I rushed back outside, and he was going pretty slow about halfway across the parking lot. And I made a big circle because I didn't want to startle him. And I said, sir, may I shake your hand? And he put his cane in the other hand. And I took that little frail hand, that little frail hand that I know that I could have crushed if I wanted to. And I said, thank you for giving me and my wife the life that we have it's because of people like you sir that put your life on the line that I will never have to put mine 
It's because of people like you. And his son began to cry. It's because of people like you that I can stand proud still to be an American. It's because of people like you that even though who's in the White House and does not care and who's in the Senate and does not care, it was people like you that put sand in your boots and put, uh, put uh, sand on your hands to, to land wherever you landed and make a life for me. I live off your blessing and I thank you. And his eyes teared up and he said, you're welcome. He knew. He knew. His son knew. You know that we live off another person's blessing. And the question is, will we bless? Will we be people of such character and of such strength that there will be a blessing 25 years from now? Because this 91-year-old gentleman can't do that again. He can't. He would. But he can't. So it's up to us. Whether we're storming a beachhead or trying to make a little church, trying to get the wheels under us, because they just keep falling off every time we put them on. <laughs> or, or it's a home where you're raising your children or somebody else. Where you're doing what God has called you to do and you'll never make a penny for it. Will you be strong enough to, in the midst of all that you have to do to pass a blessing on to somebody else? Because if we don't make appropriations for the ones coming after us, who will? Who will? I know you're busy. I know you get tired. I get tired too. But folks, this is a war. And I'm here to fight it. And I ask you please to realize that we are a beachhead. We took this church by storm. It's a rugged old hill and we took it. And by all that's in the power of God, I refuse to get run off of it. God has put us here and we will stay until God moves. And by doing that, we make certain that a blessing is to be passed on. Father, I pray for these people seated here today. I pray for the people watching us that we will feel the chills of the power of the Holy Spirit when we realize that we are called to war. The fathers are called to war so that the sons will know how to fight. Who's going to show? TV? I doubt it. The music industry? I know it won't. Father, they need to see men and women leaning on their canes with battle scars upon their face and seeing in these people, people that would not run that would not shy away from a fight, that have claimed a beachhead for Jesus and have stood their ground no matter what. Only then do we pass blessings to the next generation. For it's in Jesus' precious name I say amen and amen. Do we have a